Hello, I'm Tony Robb, solo flute of the Oxford Philharmonic Orchestra, and I'm joined today by Chichi Wanaku, founder and artistic director of Chinake. We're going to talk about the life and achievements of the composer Joseph Bologna, Chevalier Saint-Georges. Joseph Bologna was the son of a wealthy plantation owner, Georges de Bologna Saint-Georges, and his wife's African slave, Anne, known as Nanon. He was born on Christmas Day, 1745, in Guadeloupe. In 1753, at the age of seven, his father brought him to Paris and installed him in a boarding school before returning to Guadeloupe. In 1755, his father returned with his wife and Joseph's mother to Paris. Very little is known of his musical training. He is first mentioned as the dedicatee of two violin concertos by Lully in 1764, and two years later, a set of string trios by Gossek. In 1769, the Paris audiences were amazed to see the champion fencer playing violin in Gossek's new orchestra, the Concert des Amateurs. Four years later, he became its conductor and concertmaster. Chichi, thank you so much for speaking to me today. Um, he's not a composer that we, we know greatly, and I, I understand that you actually only sort of discovered him quite late on in your career, is that correct? Absolutely correct. I discovered him in uh, about 2006 and was completely blown away that a composer with a similar background heritage, i.e. African mixed race heritage, to me. To, 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 to know suddenly that there was this composer and virtuoso um, that I'd never heard of. And, and not just any old composer and virtuoso, but of the highest degree. And Oxford Philharmonic are catching up now, um, only sort of 15 years later, but we've, we've really enjoyed um, exploring his works that we've been performing in these concerts. Mm. Um, we've paired him with Mozart in these concerts. Um, did they have any connection? They certainly did. In fact, they lived under the same roof <laughs> for three months in Paris in the years at the time when Mozart's mother had passed away, Mozart was again on one, on one of his trips through Europe, his concert, concert trips through Europe, and he discovered the part that his mother had passed away and he was devastated. So he, he was at a very low point and ended up staying in Paris for three months in Gossek's house. Gossek was Saint-Georges' was Saint -Georges composition teacher and happened to be staying at the house at the same time. So for sure, they got to know each other. And there's all sorts of rumors and discussions about their relationship. I think, I think Mozart was pretty impressed, pretty blown away by this not just talented um, musician and, and performer and composer, but he was very handsome as well. And <laughs> he, you know, he was a bit, you know, the, the, the ladies did like him. And, and we, have, we have clear evidence that Mozart heard his music. We don't have any evidence that Saint-Georges heard Mozart's music. And we can see, and quite often when we hear clips or, or music by Saint-Georges, people say, oh, it sounds just like Mozart. And the fact is Mozart was 10 years younger. And, right. and some people say, well, no, people should say, Mozart sounds like the white Saint-Georges, you know, why not the other way around? And who was writing music like that in Paris, in France? We, you know, we, we were familiar with the style of Mozart, Haydn, Stamitz maybe, but to have that kind of style going, going on in virtuosic string writing in France was pretty, I mean, he was unique, this, this guy. And of course he, he he, he, he was given everything that money could buy because he, you know, his father was an aristocrat and, so you, and, and loved the child. That's why he brought him with him from Guadeloupe with his mother, Nanon, as you mentioned in your introduction. But you know, this, it just goes to show what is possible for any child, regardless of their heritage or ethnic or background, what is possible if you've had access and an opportunity from a young age. So, so how would he have been viewed in Paris at the time, in society? I mean, obviously he must have been a bit of an anomaly. I think he was viewed in a very exotic way um, because, you know, he clearly 
you know, this was the height of the slave trade yes. time. You know, slave trading was seriously going on in a big way across Europe. And to see such an exquisitely dressed and educated young man operating in high society, in the aristocratic circles. He was Marie Antoinette's music teacher, for example. Yes. And that became the leader and director of the, the, concert, the, the concert Amateur and the Concert Olympique, I think it was called, the other orchestra, yes. which was considered the greatest orchestra in Europe, not just in France. And, you know, he, he could be seen directing from the violin music that he'd written. I mean, it, he was just an extraordinary, extraordinarily high achiever. We, we should, maybe we should explore, I mean, how do you think he viewed himself? Was he primarily a fencer, uh, an exhibition fencer, or was he a composer and a musician and a violinist? Which, which do you think I was think more he important? Went the, I think he went the same way around that I did. Right. I started out as an athlete, yeah. as a sprinter. I stopped doing that because I had a knee injury but music was always going on in the background. It was a passionate hobby. And because of you know, it, all the stories that, 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 that surround my musical training, anyone would have thought it was just gonna be obvious that I was gonna be a musician, but actually no, the sprinting was going on in a much more major way until I was forced to stop at the age right. of 17 and a half. And so Saint-Georges was winning, you know, he was a European champion at the age of 15 or 17 when he beat uh, Picard. Who, who, was who was the European champion and, and, um, until he was beaten by Saint-Georges. And, <laughs> and, then, and then just, I think it was, John, it was John Adams, John Adams, who was at that time, he was the American ambassador to France. And when he returned to America, he became the second president of the United States. And there's a wonderful quote from him when he talked about his time in Europe. Um, because he was actually at that fencing, the European f fencing championship, witnessing this 17-year-old beating Picard and, and then becoming, you know, the youngest European champion of fencing. And then later on the same day, being at a concert and seeing the same guy <laughs> <laughs> leading the orchestra from the violin. You know, people just couldn't believe, hang on, that's the same person. Yes. And it, it was an extraordinary, you know, I don't think there has been anyone there was anyone at the time or since like Saint-Georges. He was a unique character. Uh, and, and so, you know, and jo John Adams famously said that he felt that Saint-Georges was the most accomplished man in Europe. That's extraordinary. Um, I mean, you mentioned Marie Antoinette, who he was, he was teaching composition to, and I know that she, she patronised him, and in fact, um, she, she was quite... Um, keen that he should take a post with the Paris Opera, is that correct? Absolutely, when, um, that, when that, that was the most senior possible job um, as director of the Paris Opera. But it didn't happen, did it? It didn't happen, and the thing is, Saint-Georges was the most qualified mm. for that job. And then three women who were employed by the Paris Opera um, put together a, a campaign, a petition, and sent it to the Queen saying, you know, we recognise that this, this chap is highly qualified, but we could not be under the, any orders of a mulatto. And in what the end, that, what a mulatto is like a mixed race person. Okay. They, they, they felt it was just beneath them to be directed by someone of this ethnicity. It was just going one step too far for them. But on the other hand, do you know, those three women were kind of past their sell-by dates. <laughs> Two of them were opera singers and one was a dancer, right. pr a principal, former principal dancer at the opera. She was already 45 years of age and getting bad reviews. The two singers were also, you know, mature and uh, they'd passed their prime. And they knew that if someone of that quality took over the directorship with such high standards, he was coming in and they would be on the way out. And so they were protecting themselves, really. So actually nobody got appointed. No one got the job. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And um, I mean, not just Marie Antoinette, but of course he, he toured and he came over to this country. And I believe he was quite friendly with um, the Prince Regent. Yes, who, who, who became who, King George. Who came, yes. came George the yeah, Fourth. Yeah. Um, and and 
uh, and there was some there was some story of him um, uh, doing a, a fencing exhibition, but against a lady. That's right, Chevalier Dion. We should talk about his music a little bit, maybe as well. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm only familiar with the pieces that we performed, but I'm going to explore and find out some more about some of his other pieces because he wrote a lot. He wrote operas, he wrote symphonies, he wrote symphonic concertantes, some chamber music. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, the pieces that we've we've been doing in these concerts, I've been fascinated by particularly his. Um, inventiveness with his phrase lengths because he, he he does in a very similar way to Mozart does he doesn't stick to the sort of four square boxing of, of, of musical ideas I mean I've noticed five bar phrases seven bar phrases and extending and um, so I mean how how is it that we don't know more about his music why has it been neglected well we could talk about this for quite a long time when it comes to composers and musicians of color throughout history they have been historically overlooked, suppressed, put to one side. As soon as they die, we don't hear about them anymore. It's the same of, with Samuel Coleridge Taylor, Florence Price, William Grant Still. The list goes on, George Walker. We're still trying to unravel the reasons why black excellence and black ability and accomplishments is stifled and being bypassed. Who's the gatekeeper? And it's down to that. It really is down to that. And it's not, as, as you've yourself have discovered with San George's wonderful music, it's not due to lack of talent and ability. And, and when we think about how, you know, Mozart copied, literally copy and paste, <laughs> um, a piece that he heard being performed in Paris while he was there, um, it, was, it, was that, it was a figure that San George coined. It, it, it's, it goes up. I'm a really bad singer, but I'm going to try and sing it. It goes, it goes, da 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 he was probably a much better violinist than Mozart as well, because the, the, the composers who wrote for their, their instrument yes. would write for themselves to play most of the time. And so we, we know that because we know, I mean, Anne-Sophie Mutter, I've been speaking with her recently, actually I interviewed her for my Bridge Tower documentary. She's just discovered San George. <laughs> she can't get enough of it. And she's saying, why didn't we know about him? Yes. He should be being taught in every conservatoire in, you know, and, audition material for, for getting jobs. It's always Mozart, concerto, number, whatever. whatever. Yes. And why do we stop there? We've, there's another level that we can go. I would love people to other, I would like you to tell me why you think their music is not being heard. I had one idea and you can shoot me down in flames if you think I'm wrong. I mean, I, the one thing that I have noticed about his music is that the instrumentation is fairly similar throughout. And I wondered if this is linked to the fact that he was um, connected with one particular orchestra and it's oboes, horns, strings, and whether the lack of variety in um, color and voices, you know, he's, he, he, he was working within set parameters um, due, due to his job. Whereas Mozart, who was going all around Europe working with different opera houses rather than just one opera house. I mean, does, do the and operas have more instruments in them? Do you know? I'm not sure. He wrote three operas, possibly more, three that we know about. And, you know, Mozart was <clears throat> 10 years younger. Yes. And so clarinet was coming in, yep. you know, and um, that was not coming in. That, San George had not come across that. But composers before him wrote for similar arrangements. There's plenty, there's, there's, that's, that's not a reason for me. That, no. that, that it's, it, it's a reason, but all of Mozart's, it, his music is very formulaic. Mm -hmm. it's, I always know when it's Mozart. Yes. I mean, I always know when it's St. George because it's <laughs> just got another kind of spirit to it, another kind of style, and it's so unique. I always know when it's Beethoven, but they wrote with, for what was available. Yes. You know, and that didn't, that, that didn't, um, it doesn't make their music, um, 
unfavourable to play. Well, he was obviously incredibly respected at the time, wasn't he? Because, I mean, I think, um, am I right, Haydn came to Paris and, and there was there's the series of Paris symphonies. The, they, they commissioned, I think it was Gossack, yeah. or from, from the orchestra, it was Gossack's orchestra. They wanted to commission Haydn to write some music for them. Yes. So they sent Saint-Georges down to Austria. Ah. So Saint-Georges, in fact, he went twice to, and he met Papa Haydn and who taught Mozart, Beethoven, everybody else and Schubert, etc. And he, and so Haydn would have been like a kid in a sweet shop because his orchestra consisted of about 12 players. Yes. That included wind and strings. Mm -hmm. Yet he wrote up to 80 symphonies. He had written already about 80 odd odd symphonies and to be asked by this gentleman to write six six symphonies for an orchestra of 66 players you can write anything you like yes. Haydn was just like hallelujah <laughs> and produced these six incredible symphonies that were premiered by Saint George's orchestra yeah. he played them all at the Versailles Palace to Marie Antoinette she a adored them and I think he played them more than once and she particularly liked symphony number 85 which is called La Reine, La Reine. because yes. of uh, Marie Antoinette but there was they they were yeah I mean they they bought it to Haydn and got him out of his you know his 12 or 12 um, dozens uh, a, a, an orchestra of a dozen it just expanded the whole the whole symphonic range for him and of course, so. that had a massive impact on the symphony going forward the next hundred years, didn't it? Exactly. And he ended up in London. I, I, perhaps he did call in on him on his way to London. Well, of course, Haydn he later, came to this very yeah, building yes, and exactly. performed, in this, yeah. you know, performed his Oxford Symphony in this very building, which is extraordinary. Mm. Um, Saint-Georges the Fencer, how would, how would that link in with him as a violinist? I mean, you, know, you talk about athletes, and I always think musicians, we are athletes. We have to be, we, we train, practice all the time. I mean, it, it, he, was, he was a virtuoso violinist, wasn't he? So he was. do you think his fencing informed that? He was a virtuoso violinist. Could I just read you a little oh. quote from his fencing teacher? Yes, please. I've got it with me here. This is one of his, his fencing teachers speaking about him after he'd finished teaching him. No one ever deployed more grace, more assurance in the obligatory exercises. His development was superb. His hand held at the highest possible elevation made him the master of his adversary's weak point. His left foot, solidly planted, never moved out of position, and his right leg remained perpendicular at all times. This afforded him the means to strike with lightning speed. He was able to transfer his foil into his left hand so swiftly that the defendant did not have time to meet the iron for the parade. Such dexterity must seem incredible to those who've never seen it with their own eyes. I mean, this guy was ambidextrous. Yes. <laughs> he, he was flicking his foil from one hand to the, to the and apparently as adept with the left hand as he was with the, it's like a footballer that suddenly he was a right-handed yep. footballer that, that, that then shoots a goal with the left. And of course, the control at the end of his foil tells me that he was already onto the high-tech new bow, yes. the, the taut bow, which was, the, which was the, the, the design of the modern bow that we have today. That, so they were building this bow now that had a much more powerful tip. And he, just looking at his writing, there's no way that those pieces that, that he wrote, that, that sort of, which leap from one end of the, the bow, you know, da, 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 you know, to the other, with real dynamism at the tip as well. You couldn't do that with a Baroque bow. You no. simply couldn't do it. So music and technology already being demonstrated in his technique, which has come straight from the fen fencing as well. You know, that, that complete control all the way down the foil, all the way down the bow. Lightning bowing, lightning uh, strikes with the, with the fencing. And I think I've always loved technology. I, I mean, I, you know, I love working on my computer I'm not that great at it I mean I write emails but I've always felt that technology and music have been closely related 
and you know when I used to read stories about Beethoven smashing his way through pianos like you know they had to keep building bigger and bigger pianos because Beethoven just smashed them up you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and you know and with the virtuosity that Saint-Georges had in Paris the taut bow was evolved in France they were using that style of bow before that bow was down even before it got to be you know the first person who played the Beethoven violin concerto was Clement. He played it with a Baroque bow. He struggled. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, it was, it's, that's laughable because, I mean, Beethoven had evolved the, the, for the violin concerto, but, but unfortunately the bow hadn't yet got down to Vienna at that time. But, you know, San George was ahead of the game. He really was. Yes. He two wrote symphonies. two symphonies. He wrote, he wrote 18 string quartets. 14 violin concertos, many, many arias that stand alone arias, a lot of sonatas for violin, sonatas for harpsichord. And I've heard that he even wrote a sonata for harp with a flute obbligato part, which I'm going to look out. You have to yeah. look that up. Yes. Um, because I hope it's still around. I hope it there's will a... be somewhere. It yes. will be somewhere in the Bibliotheque in Paris, or there are people across the world who, who, are, who also edit his music. So. Yeah. I'll well, find it. I'll find it. You know, Mozart flute and harp. Maybe he even wrote it before Mozart. Maybe, Mo maybe, maybe Mozart heard it and, and was inspired to write <laughs> his one. That's often the case. <laughs> often the Excellent. case. Yeah. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you about this amazing composer. And um, I can only thank you for your time and your expertise and all your knowledge and sharing it with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Chichi. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about it. And it's so important for us purveyors of, of music who are of ethnic diversity backgrounds, but we have your allyship. The, and because it needs to be perpetuated, not only by us, but by people like yourself. So thank well, you very fine. much. Uh, keep, keep the passion, keep the flame burning, and, and let's expand it into all of the schools and, and all musicians. The more of us that talk about it, the better, and play it. Definitely. Thank you very much thank indeed. You.